Hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics. And tonight, a video that I feel is important. It's not something that I want to be reporting. Uh, I think it's something, though, that is important, especially with a lot of money going into the silver space over the last week and a half, especially a lot of money going into the SLV Trust and a lot of unusual things that happened in the past week, which I would suggest warrant further investigation by the regulatory agencies, by the legal authorities, including the CFTC, the Department of Justice, the FBI, the SEC, and perhaps I would think this is worthy of a congressional investigation because this is an issue that has left the American economy vulnerable and also there's a track record of behavior and a lot of warning signs that I would pray are coincidences, but certainly I was raised to be honest. I was raised to speak up when I see something that does not look right. I've lived through the collapse of the dot-com bubble, the housing bubble. I've seen Bernie Madoff's thing fall and just for anyone who might be new or seeing me for the first time, my background, my first two years were at Moody's. Within my first couple months, I lived through seeing the Enron situation and then September 11th. Went to Wharton MBA for finance, was trading equity options on the American Stock Exchange when the subprime bubble began to collapse. Traded equity options then on the New York Stock Exchange running a specialist post and then left to report on what I was starting to see about a manipulated gold and silver market. And I have an update tonight because there's certainly a lot of history to this, but some things that certainly in the very least, I think SLV investors should know because when I shared this with a colleague of mine earlier today, I, who's a fund manager, I said, if you were aware of this and you held shares of this and you did nothing, and did not even notify your customers, would that put you out of fiduciary responsibility? I also asked him, if you had a million dollar position, now that you know this, what would you do tomorrow when the market opens? And he said, I would sell, I would have to sell. This is someone that I would qualify as an expert witness in court. And to add, Keep in mind that we are gonna mention JP Morgan here. And last thing I have any interest in doing is going to court with anyone. And I understand uh, some of the statements I'm making might seem extreme, but to begin with, it's important to point out, we're, we're going to be talking about a crime that they've already been caught committing. And that I feel there's some evidence here, at the very least worthy of investigating to show that not only may they have committed it again this week, or it sure appears that one of the banks did the same thing this week, but additionally that I think you could make the case there are fiduciary breaches between JP Morgan and SLV already. And I hope that all of the metal is there, especially because a large amount of metal went into those trusts in the past week and a half. I don't believe it's possible the numbers are being reported, but again, I might add that everything that I'm gonna mention in this broadcast will either support with the data or I've asked multiple experts. You can look on my show and see the people I bring on. Some, one is a com former compliance officer for a large accounting firm, expert traders, silver analysts. So this has been verified and I'll, I'll show you the evidence as well, but to begin with, it's important to note, here's JP Morgan on September 29th of last year, we fined $920 million for something called spoofing here at JP Morgan for manipulative and deceptive contact and spoofing that spanned at least eight years and involved hundreds of thousands of spoof orders in precious metals and US treasury futures. We'll stick to precious metals tonight. So they've already been caught doing this. Now, in the confessions, you also, uh, from each trader that confessed before this, they mentioned that it was widespread practice at the firm and it was done with the knowledge of the superiors. So it was not a rogue junior trader doing this. 
here we see JP Morgan also settled a lawsuit accused, accusing the firm of spoofing. And it's interesting here, JP Morgan, which declined comment, long has denied engaging in spoofing. And then they settled and then they were fined. Let's look at the exact legal wording here. Issued an order filing and so they settled with the CFTC. They settled with Daniel Schack's court case which means they did not choose to appear in court. They did not choose to comment on this article. There have been uh, myself as well as others who have been very critical publicly about them for years. I've never heard from them. I don't know any other analyst who has. And here you can see <clears throat> Long has denied engaging in spoofing. So that means they lied about it. So certainly what I'm establishing is that there is a precedent that no matter what JP Morgan says at this point, it needs to be examined with evidence, which is what we'll do. And I might add on one note for anyone who's wondering how this might be relevant. Um, the most important thing tonight is to inform the investors who have been stolen from and cheated, some information that's useful. And along those lines, consider uh, here is the attorneys for Daniel Shack, Grumit and Wacker on my list to contact um, because whatever Daniel Sack said that they wrote a check for, I would encourage other people to do the same. Here is a book by Helen Chapman called JP Madoff, where 200 pages of their involvement as the sole banker for Bernie Madoff, another Ponzi scheme, and a whole host of other crimes. So we'll leave that aside, but I feel it's important that to be clear, this is not slander. This is all based on their own track record that they created and that they've committed crimes. And it appears that somebody did something that I would say is exactly what you just saw them get caught doing. And I'll show you the evidence. And again, I would just, more so than anything else, I encourage further investigation. That's why I'm being very careful about my wording tonight. I, as a silver analyst, who puts his name on his content and, and gets honest information. And while I can't, I'm human, so I don't claim that I get everything right, but you can hold me to anything that I've done if I've done it and I've done it honestly. As many of you know, about a week and a half ago, there were some short squeezes, in, is, short squeezes a couple of stocks, GameStop and others, Escalated last Wednesday, week and a half ago, Wednesday. By Thursday, there was talk of that in the silver market. By Friday, silver squeeze was a hashtag. And there was a lot of attention. And there was a lot of activity in there. And here we can see, this is the chart. Because that activity escalated over the weekend. Now those who, as I report on my program and I will show you uh, briefly here. There's, you can see, basically this has been covered the entire time. Here's a physical silver dealer. There's more physical. I brought several physical sil silver dealers on. Here is a panel of silver industry experts. This is a week ago from today. So this has all been documented and covered because there was a lot of attention on this. And there are a lot of people who have known what's been going on for a long time. And I think it's a good time for others to become aware of that as well. So coming out of the weekend, here's this, the open Sunday night. Silver opens almost $2 higher immediately. Buying continues. And we'll show the evidence of that. The blue line comes the red line. And by um, Monday morning, futures price even got over 30, but you see on the wave of a lot of buying, I have owner of one billion dealer that I have a relationship with, but I believe would I would put my name to this in court. She, I asked, is this by far and away the busiest day in the history of your company in the 30 years you've owned it? And she responded, it's like toilet paper in 2020. I saw, there's, I saw them each night late, not being able to fill the orders because there were lists of phone numbers and names, although I guess perhaps real quick, just so this, none of this is my opinion or my word. Here is Zero Hedge reporting 
Wednesday uh, that the U.S. Mint warns it can't meet surging demand for gold and silver. We have some quotes from other bullion dealers. Again, I showed you the videos where you can see it yourself. It's led to bullion dealers running dry of stock. Physical premiums are soaring. Anybody can look. We saw last Sunday night, in fact, part of what spiked this is that the dealers were selling so much silver. Now this is physical silver that you can hold in your hand. The dealers were selling so much silver beginning on Saturday that many of them had to suspend sales because they were not able to continue selling unhedged. They, they could see the price was likely to open higher because in a, in a normal market, when there's rapid demand price rises. So I believe it was JM Bullion, SD Bullion and Atmex Saturday night suspended sales because they, they, could, they didn't wanna sell naked short. The opposite of what some of the banks have been caught doing. So as that happened, of course, supply and demand, when you limit what someone can do, that usually increases the demand. And so it made a lot of sense that the price opened up. And again, we'll go back and just show that. Here is David Mitchell, Managing Director at Indigo Precious Metals. There are massive shortages. We'll be completely out of stock if it carries on like this. First time since our company opened in Singapore seven years ago. Peter Fung, head of Hong Kong, Wing Fung metals in the short term. Stocks may run out since it takes a long time for sea shipping, but overall supply is ample. And then here is courtesy of Reuters. The US Mint is limiting distribu distribution of its gold, silver, and platinum coins to specific dealers because of heavy demand. Heavy buying has continued into 2021, it said, squeezing supplies, which had already been tight as the coronavirus affected production. And then, you know, as you might expect, the price goes up. But what is interesting is that here's Tuesday, or no, yeah, green is Tuesday. So here's Monday, the price sits in, sitting in between, let's call it in 28 and 29. And then Tuesday, this is, keep in mind, this is 2, 3 a.m. New York time. Price begins to fall, which is odd because now I, I have the credentials as a former equity options specialist on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I was trained specifically that if you had a large position to execute, you don't do it when liquidity is thinnest. I didn't need trading to do that because any trader who's been trading for more than a day finds out quickly that if you want to sell high and buy low, you don't hammer on a big position in the middle of the night. So it seems a little odd that the price falls here throughout the day until you get down here below $26. So despite all this buying that's blowing out the US Mint, by Tuesday, the price is actually lower. Now, if you're wondering why that is, I've also wondered, did a lot of people read this report? Miners decline as JP Morgan downgrades sector and silver prices slide from eight year high. Now, as people who have traded on Wall Street are very well familiar of how headlines can be used to influence investor perceptions, miners decline as JP Morgan downgrades sector and silver prices slide. The way that is phrased, there sure seems to be some cause and effect there. And what's interesting though, is if you read through the article, you'd probably think with a headline like that, after dealer physical dealers are getting blown out and have to go offline, you wonder what they would, how they, how would they would justify that given those conditions. And, but if you search through here, not only don't they talk about that, this article doesn't even really provide any reason of supporting that. Doesn't mention the physical buying. Doesn't mention what happened in SLV either, which we'll get to. Doesn't mention much. Now I have not yet seen JP Morgan's report firsthand. I'm working on getting a copy of that. There's a few things that I will have soon, but I felt this was important to get out now. That's one of them. But I was, I've heard from someone who read it. We'll call this complete rumor mill, but heard there's not much more discussed in the report either. I've not seen it yet. I'll look forward to seeing it. 
But keep in mind, this is at 4.59 a.m. February 2nd. So that means after what everything we just discussed that happened Monday in the process of blowing out the physical dealers, Tuesday morning, they placed this headline five, at 5 a.m. Eastern. And here's 5 a.m. Eastern, the price is already down. So it'd be interesting. And here's the first of several questions that I would encourage people to send to the CFTC, to your regulators, to your congressmen, to the White House. Did JP Morgan short the market here? Did other participants who got JP Morgan's report before it was released, were they involved in this spike down? Did JP Morgan's report influence that despite the reports of buying and what happened in SLV that the price continued lower? Because that doesn't really seem to make much intuitive sense that when people are buying every form of silver available, that the price goes down right at that time. But that could be a coincidence. It, and again, I would say, hopefully the CFTC and the appropriate regulators will ask that question. But we will come back to that. The other thing I wonder is that also on Market Watch, I was looking the previous night, and you had a couple stocks that were short, like GameStop. And then in addition to talk of a squeeze on silver, there's been a large short position on First Majestic, which we actually discussed on the show about a week before this happened. And here, when the day on Monday, when silver goes up, First Majestic, which had been a $14 stock, if you go back a day farther, shoots up to $25. And when there's a short position on that, I remember from my days on the floor, that's when shops get blown out. Now, I don't know exactly who was holding what there, but that's a big move. And it's interesting because here by the end of Tuesday, it's down to 21.28. But look what happens when the price of silver gets hammered or here, this was the end of Monday, I'm sorry. Here you see the end in Tuesday, following down the price of silver. And certainly, while it's a question for open investigation, that was fortunate for whoever was short 23% of the float of First Majestic Silver. But you could say that, <clears throat> You know, maybe there's a lot of people who are buying SLV, the iShares Silver Trust, and that's a relevant data point. Now, JB Morgan's article didn't mention anything about the order flow into SLV, but I'll cover it here. Because SLV, if you take a look, this is data from their own website. January 28th, that's Thursday. 29th is Friday and you can see over here is the amount of metal. And you can see that between Thursday, you had 610 million ounces. And then by Tuesday, this would have been the close on Tuesday, you had 729 million ounces. So what that means is that and I know to, to avoid any confusion, I did call iShares this week. I confirmed these questions. If there's any mistake here, it's the iShares representative. I'm reporting what they said and I'm using their own data. So Thursday, you're at the close 610. I asked the iShares representative, when shares are added, does that mean that you know there's an order in to get the metal that you know it's gonna be in there soon? She said, when shares are added, metals deposited that day. I said, there's never any exceptions or any, anything else I'm not thinking of. I, I re repeated it, asked, is my understanding correct? She confirmed that it was. Said, who, who adds or who puts the metal in or takes it out? Who's in control of that process? She says, the custodian. I say, who's the custodian? JP Morgan the custodian of the trust. JP Morgan, who rather than ever commenting on it, the only time they've commented on it was when Blythe Masters said, 
they don't manipulate the markets because that would be wrong. Then why did they settle charges for manipulating it hundreds of thousands of times for the last eight years? Why did not one, but several of their traders say that it was widespread practice at the firm and that it was taught to them by their superiors? And why are they the custodian of SLV? Is that a conflict of interest? But we can go back to the data. That's a question that hopefully the CFTC can comment on because by the time that JP Morgan issues this report at 4.59 a.m., let's look at what happened in the SLV trust of which they are the ones who are adding or subtracting the metal. So here's February 2nd. So we'll, we'll leave that out because that would have been at the close um, of February 2nd, I would assume. So we'll just, we'll leave that out for a second, but between from close of Thursday until the close of Monday, you went from 610 to 667. So that's 57 million ounces of silver were deposited into the SLV trust. And JP Morgan cannot say that they don't know because again, as we just pointed out, they're the custodian. That wasn't mentioned when they, JP Morgan issued a report that particular time with this headline. Okay, this is Market Watch's headline. I don't know what is the relationship there. I hope it's honest and clean, but yeah, and JP Morgan's name is on that that time, and this was happening in the physical market, and you had 57 million ounces added to SLV. And I know like these numbers, especially for people who are new to silver can easily 57, 500, what's, what's the difference? To put that in perspective, here's the Silver Institute. This is their numbers projected for 2020. It's an update from a couple months ago. See each year, the total supply is about a billion ounces. And then you can see that here is your demand. So first line, industrial photography, jewelry, silverware. We won't dig into the overall demand profile. I don't know of anyone who sees these coming down anytime soon. So let's say it just stays the same. These add up to about 700. Now net physical investment demand, that's the bullion dealers we talked about. And last year they had 236 million. And based on bullion dealers going on record as calling it panic buying, and my own partner handles the, the, the customer inquiries because we have a partnership with a bullion dealer. I asked her to describe it. I've checked everything I've said before I've gone on the air and she said, people don't care what the premiums are. They're just want it, which I think is fair to say is panic buying. Doesn't matter. Just to, to say that it's hard to see this number coming down based on what's happened. So again, last year you had 962 million in supply because some of the mines were shut down from COVID a little lower. And if we assume these numbers I don't know any silver analysts who have made a case that these are coming down. So if they stayed the same and you had 931, that means what was left over for the silver trust last year was the balance, which is 31 and a half. Now last year, which was a record year, they took 350 million ounces in, but they put that on the credit card because they ran a deficit. So 31 and a half million ounces if that's what was available for the entire supply last year, and in, on Friday, before JP Morgan's sell recommendation, Friday alone, 34 million ounces were added. So you would think that before this article was written, someone would have been aware of that, especially given that they are the custodian of the trust. Then on Monday, another 20 million ounces were added. So now you basically doubled 
what was left for that supply in two days. And then personally, where I felt it was important to speak up and say something is that when Tuesday, I saw the number that 61 million were added. I don't see how that's possible. But again, I don't go and make comments frivolously. I've checked with multiple people that are highly respected in the silver industry. I think some of them on the air. In fact, you can, we did a round table on this the other night. We're here, former auditor, experienced trader and banker, experienced trader and banker. I've worked on a trading floor for seven years. And you can hear here that none of them believe that it's possible, not even that it's physically possible. And keep in mind, JP Morgan is the custodian of the trust. And they reported about 120 million ounces. Let's go back to the numbers here. So from 610 to by the end of Tuesday, by the end of the day that JP Morgan issued that report, 120 million ounces had been added to the trust that they are the custodian of which is four times what was available for the trust last year. I've not been able to find anyone who knows where the deficit is being made up from. And now 120 million ounces went in there. By the end of the day, that JP Morgan issued a sell report. Now you could say, well, there were others like TD Ameritrade that said the silver squeeze is dead. Google searches are trending lower. The silver squeeze hashtag is falling. They didn't mention anything about SLV or the uh, physical demand. We have another chart here. This is the price and volume chart. Red line is the price, blue is the volume. This is something anyone who's been following the silver market for any period of time familiar with because we've seen JP Morgan do this hundreds of thousands of times. We're familiar with it. And while there is not, I can't tell you if this is specifically JP Morgan, I would ask you who's watching, especially if you're an SLV investor, if the, SC, if the CFTC, have they pulled these trading records and looked how here, and just so we can see exactly what time that is, so here's that first big drop down. That's at 2 a.m. Eastern time. So New York markets are not open. It's right here, that's 2 a.m. in the morning. I will, I will testify in court that I would have been most likely fired from my trading shop if I had done something like that. I was specifically trained never to do something like that. Here, you see it again. And just like the CFTC found last year when they fined JP Morgan $920 million, you can look through charts all day long. These aren't hard to find. So at 2 a.m., someone dumps a lot of volume on the market, price collapses. Somewhere around here is when the public gets notice of J.P. Morgan's sell report. So I'm curious who sold up there and why they felt that in the middle of, and I might add, if we go back here, there's a round table we did on that the weekend before price spiked, which would be right here, where I, on Sunday, the night that it spiked, I got as many of these silver experts, there's David Morgan, widely recognized as the top, most well-known expert, there was nine others. And I asked them all, does this feel different to the degree that even the ones that had seen the Hunt brothers? And they all said, yes, you can watch it for yourself. Their words, not mine. So going back to the chart here, in the face of longtime silver veterans saying, even they're like, even the ones who have seen it a million times, say it's greater than the Hunt brothers. Someone, I'm curious how some, who would explain that. And I think that is worthy of some sort of investigation because it's the same crime that we have here. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, well, what is spoofing? You know, is that really at the heart of the issue here? And I'm going to point out why I think that's a matter of semantics, because fortunately, 
again, this isn't a matter of my opinion or that you have to take my word for it because shortly before his passing, former CFTC commissioner, Bart Chilton. So this was someone who was actually part of these investigation, I believe the years were 2009 to 2014. They publicly said there was no evidence Bart Chilton in the interview I did confirmed plenty of evidence. And again, we know that that first commission's ultimate ruling that overruled Bart was incorrect because here we found hundreds of thousands of evidence spanning back at least eight years, which I believe the dates overlap. But here it's interesting because I explained my understanding of how the mechanics of the crime occur and we'll play his four minutes. We're going to play his whole response so you can see the whole thing. And then you can decide for yourself whether at least is a legitimate request for the CFTC. And I have their mission statement pulled up here. The mission of this community Commodity Future Trading Commission is to promote the integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of the U.S. derivatives markets through sound regulation. So based on that, and based on what one of their own former commissioners, you're going to hear it for yourself, if that warrants investigation. So we'll, we'll hear it. Again, I go. appreciate you mentioning the spoofing. Curious, uh, because uh, my understanding of what, how some of the manipulation has occurred is that, you know, if silver is trading $20.05, there's a lot of stop orders placed around the $20 handle. So often if the price can get pushed a little bit, then you get a lot of those high frequency algorithms kicking in. And then you'll see a drop with many feeling that people kind of nudging a little are then able to buy lower. Does that right. sound like a reasonably accurate portrayal to put it in perspective to folks or would you phrase it differently well it's a, it's a good portray it's a good portrayal but it's actually it's a very good portrayal so then he describes spoofing for the next three minutes before summing it up with these in nanoseconds so uh the difference in your description is that today when a market moves because of a spoof it can move a lot more Today, when a market moves because of a spoof, it can move a lot more. You heard me ask him, is that how it works, that they nudge a little bit, that it falls? Because you keep in mind, Monday, you also had margin requirements raised. So the market's already sensitive. So if someone puts something like this, and the reason you don't do that is because you want to sell high. You want to sell something for the biggest price you can. If you have a 1,000 shares, and the bid is only for 10 and you just do a market order, you're gonna get filled lower and lower. And because people want to make money, no one voluntarily throws their money away. That's why you can see that this, this, is, this is exactly what Bart described, exactly what JP Morgan just got fined $920 million for doing. Again, fortunately, there's coverage of all this throughout the past week. You don't have to take this my word for it. I have not been able to find someone to disagree with anything that I've laid out here so far. But in this part, I find very unfortunate. There's a bit more because when I saw the 61 million allegedly added on Tuesday, and I asked former auditors, silver experts, traders, anyone in the silver business, if they can see any way that's possible. And they said, no, they had the same feeling as I did. I started getting concerned. And so on Friday, I called the iShares SLV Trust, which is run by BlackRock. Don't have their webpage up here, but. A, I wanted to confirm so, because no one I know, and I'm asking this as an analyst who's trying to provide good information to the silver, the people who invest in silver. I said, I wanted to make sure. I asked the representative, when iShares represents that shares are added, 
what is the system? Does the metal go that day, next day? Any No, it goes in that day. I mentioned before how she said JP Morgan's the custodian. So I, I even mentioned, I said, I'm trying to say this respectfully, but JP Morgan did just get fined $920 million for rigging gold and silver. Do you see how that's at least something worthy of further investigation? And I said, I was looking on your website for your, the audit and I couldn't find it. And she said, well, I think there's something on the SEC's website. That was a bit, that was concerning to me that the, and she was very helpful and, and really kind. So not to her, but just SLV is running a trust that you can't find the audit on their website and the representatives don't even have it which also makes me think that if she didn't even know if there was one, she was sending me to the SEC's Edgar database. So I'm assuming that means that while people were buying 120 million shares of SLV over the last couple of days, it doesn't sound like a lot of them were checking for the audit. So I said, I have a show, I cover the silver market. I don't wanna get anything inaccurate. I want to provide accurate information, but Frankly, what I'm hearing is concerning me. Is there, she says, hold on, there's someone I could ask. I said, please, I'm in no rush. Please just, just check. I, I want to just get the correct information. She directed me towards, and if you go into the documents section of SLV, you can find this inspection letter. This was all that I, she was able to send me. Now, You can see a short recap of that here, but I thought it was odd because, A, I noticed the last time was March 20th, it was almost a year ago, but in particular, because that date, March 20th, I'm thinking, wasn't it March 23rd where the the, the exchange for physical market broke, the, the bridge between New York and London? Because we covered it a lot on the show last year. It was a big event in the gold market. Something broke. There was a lot of things that still how you believe have not come out. Although here's the chart of that day. So keep in mind some dates, March 15th. That was the Sunday night announcement where the Fed announces quantitative easing. March 23rd, the Fed upgrades that to unlimited quantitative easing, which likely led to the blowout of the EFP market. Here's March, here's March 23rd, gold's at $1,500, Fed's unlimited quantitative easing, logically drives the price up. Then you see this, based on what Bart said, was that a spoof? I hope the CFTC will comment on this because while they find them, I don't know any investors who've been reimbursed and I don't know anyone who's explained that, except some of the guests that are on my shows or other shows in the silver community. To show that this was a significant event, here's HSBC, we lost $200 million on that day. Here is CIBC that lost $64 million on that day. I'm thinking, well, gee, that's kind of odd that the date is March 20th, which could be a coincidence. I don't know. I'm just saying that there's certain things that I don't have access to as a public citizen that the CFTC, and I will explain why I think that's worthy of further investigation. A, that I mean, that was one heck of a week. And this is also right after silver dropped down below $12, as you will see. So if we take a look, here is the price of silver going back a year. March 20, you can see is interestingly right here when silver is $12.35 an ounce. So right in front of a historic fracture of the gold market, plus cost of production for most of the silver miners was, was about $15. So that's, we could say it's a coincidence. It, I'd, I'd be curious if there's any comment on that. Again, oh, we don't know. But if you take a look here, 
then after a couple of days passes, remember the audit took place between February 10th and March 6th. Which is interesting because if you look back at the silver chart, that's a fascinating date range that I'll bet most people remember. So March 6th, here's silver at $17.21. March 6th, silver is $17.21. That's the day the audit was completed. So the last time anybody aside from JP Morgan has put their name to any of the contents that are in there is March 6th, when silver was $17.21 by the time it opens March 9th, it's 21 cents lower. Less than two weeks later, it's under $12. Was that a spoof? Seems kind of unusual. Here, March 16th, and a lot of silver investors remember these days because it, it dropped, but fortunately we have some data. Here's March 6th. Silver is at $17. So there's where, you know, you get a little different. That may be the futures price, but you see it might be off a couple of cents, but green line, March 6th. So this is the last day of anyone outside of JP Morgan who's been fined $920 million for manipulating the market on hundreds of thousands of occasions. Last time anyone has ever looked into a trust that just added 120 million shares, about $25 a share, so here's March 6th, last day it was audited. That certainly kind of looks like what Bart Chilton described here. And I'm working on getting the charts with volume. My, I would guess that there's probably a volume spike there. I've not seen it yet, so I'll hold off comment, but that would be something that anybody else who's researching this and wants to find what's really going on in silver, that's what I would look for. So that's the last day of the audit. And then we see right after that, Monday of next week's, then by the end of the next week, silver in the middle of one of the greatest crises. And I might add that there are plenty of bullion dealers on record back during that period as well that described similar panic buying, yet say that what we saw last week was bigger. So then there's Friday, March 13th. We have silver at $14.46. Let's take a look what happened to the price there. So here's March 16th. Look at silver falling. But what's interesting is that, why, why did I bring up March 16th? Because if we look back at the data here, which is in this one, so Again, this is data from SLV's own site because here is March 6th. So that's the day the audit's completed. Looks like that whole week was pretty constant, maybe one withdrawal of 500,000 ounces. So you have 387 million ounces the day the audit's complete on March 6th, also the day that the price is up here before it begins to fall below the cost of production goes down below $12, cost of production about 15. So this is, I've never seen any fundamental situation like this in my entire career. But then is interesting. So here is March 16. So you have 378 million ounces at the close of March 16. And then by March 17, you have 391 million ounces. So about 13 million ounces are added on the 17th but what happens in the price? Here on March 16, in the middle of panic buying, it goes from $14.5 to under 12. Bounces back up a little, then March 17th, when people are adding 13 million shares, which I might add to refresh, even that 13 million ounces, that was about, I don't know, 40% of what was actually available. They had that in one day, but on that day, 
price came down, just kind of like Bart Shilton talked about getting the, I'll bet there was heavy volume on that day. And interestingly, this has never been audited. In fact, nothing since March 6 has been audited. And you can see here, March 6, you have 387 million ounces since the last audit was completed. Now there's 704 million ounces. So what's that? 318, the thing is almost doubled. The only one who knows anything that's going on in there is JP Morgan, who the Department of Justice took the unusual step of even calling their precious metals desk a criminal enterprise. It was their, their words, not mine. And interestingly, as you can see by the press release, this happened September 29th. So this is after everything I just showed you. That was March of 2020. So even September 29th, after the last audit, after these things, which I would suggest at the very least, as the CFTC pulled the trading records here, have they looked at what I am presenting here? Here's the CFTC's, we looked at the mission statement. Here's the CFTC's budget. Is requesting a budget of $304 million. Well, I, I didn't get paid, but I, I went and interviewed the guy from their own agency that confirmed it. And if you hear Bart Chilton talks about silver manipulation, that's just a fragment of what he said. You can hear the whole thing here. His words, not mine. So with that budget, I think these are some legitimate questions. Another thing I might add here, here's the, COT's own, uh, the CFTC's own COT report. You see over the past week, same time when JP Morgan issued their report, the silver declined 10% despite historic additions into the SLV Silver Trust that JP Morgan was counted on to do. So here, this is showing net position for or less traders. So this is the four traders who have the combined largest short position, 36.3%. You look at the open interest times 5,000 ounces per contract, 36.3% of that is 326 million ounces of silver. I know some people have asserted that that's a hedge. What I don't understand is that why that increased. I believe it was over this past week Last time I looked, it was 292 million ounces. I think that was last week. I'm tracking down the data on that too. But in the last week or two, likely the last week, short position went up 34 million ounces on the COMEX. So where did JP Morgan get the silver from to put into the trust? Now we know that JP Morgan on their COMEX account, they have listed 193 million ounces the last time I looked. Verify that, but no one I know believes that they put the silver in there unless it's leased. Nobody knows if they're taking metal out of their COMEX account or putting it into there. We don't have any idea. Anyone who is invested in SLV right now we don't know. They couldn't, their iShares couldn't even find their audit. I don't know exactly where that leaves this, although I think it's darn worthy of further investigation. As a longtime silver investor, I don't own any SLV. I don't want to own SLV, and these are the reasons why. The last thing I want to come on and do is, is do something, because I understand there's going to be an impact of this, but those are the facts. And I was told to speak up when I see something inappropriate. So I'm going to leave a couple of questions that there is a download in the description field below. You can click on that. I highly encourage people send this video to the CFTC. If you're a shareholder of JP Morgan, if you're a board of director of JP Morgan, I wonder what, what, 
What do they say? I don't know, but I think they have a right to know this. Certainly people who have been trading in the silver market where we've, we've seen that JP Morgan has been caught, I think they have a right to know this. And certainly the people that are new to silver and bought those 120 million ounces, I think they have a darn right to know this. And we'll see if JP Morgan ever comments on this or on this or on that, because so far there's no words. But I'll leave some questions for investors to ask. So number one, has the CFTC pulled the trading records, the dates we looked at? Certainly Tuesday, February 2nd, this of 2021. March 6, 2020. March 13th of 2020. March 16th of 2020. I haven't gone through the rest of the SLV data, but I have a feeling there's a lot of coincidences you'd be able to find if you look through that data for even a month, let alone a year, as the CFTC pulled those records. Because with this evidence out there, if there's something inappropriate. I think these are worthy questions to be asking now to the agency that is the policeman of this market. Another question to ask, did JP Morgan short silver before they issued their report? Did other people who got that report before it was public short silver? Interestingly, if you look back at the audit, began February 7 was the count date, which ironically enough is today. I did also receive an email from someone. I cannot confirm this, but perhaps someone can check it. Um, who mentions that 10, he thinks again, 10,000 ounces due on the 27th, which has to be audited. Public companies need to file 10K every year. It has to be audited. And we have uh, COMEX delivery coming up. Given that no one has any oversight over JV Morgan on this, I would hope that would be something that would be looked at. And also, is there a new, when is the next audit, audit starting? And will they address to whoever does that audit? Hopefully they will address these questions. What would the CFTC say to silver investors about the information that I've shared? Do any of the banks or do any of the people that shorted silver, despite what was happening on Tuesday, are they also short First Majestic? Was there an even greater incentive for the price of silver to go down? I don't know, but as an investigator, I'm not accusing anyone. Well, I think there's clearly crimes that are committed, but without the records, CFTC has those records. I've taken this as far as I can, the same way that Harry Markopoulos warned of Bernie Madoff's scheme before it imploded. I've talked to the CFTC. I called them years ago. I've tried talking to the regulators. So tonight I will speak to the silver investors. Has JP Morgan paid its $920 million fine? They've been fined $920 million. Is there a confirmation that they've paid it? Where does that money go? What are the plans to reimburse the investors who have been cheated? Many of whom are watching this show right now. Many of whom have lost significant amounts of money many of whom have been laid off from their jobs for mining companies. We could go on and on the impact of this repeated crime that continues. So what are the plans to reimburse those investors? And with JP Morgan reporting 193 million, dollar, 193 million ounces of silver in their COMEX account, have I provided at least enough that a court can freeze those assets so that JP Morgan cannot have the ability to move silver in and out of those programs tomorrow without oversight? Again, I'm not a lawyer, but as a trader and an investor and someone who looks out for traders and investors, I wouldn't touch that thing. And I think it needs some oversight. And I think that those, a judge 
should be aware of this before metal moves again. Talking about a bank that has been caught on hundreds of thousands of occasions while the whole world was watching. There are a lot of coincidences. I've never heard JP Morgan respond. I was given a phone number by the iShares representative. I do plan on calling them tomorrow. I'll ask them if they have any comment. If they do, I'll report it accurately. But that's something that I think SLV investors should know and should be aware of. Sorry, this is what I have to report tonight, but I was trained to stand up, be honest, and, and stand up when I see something wrong. And there are a lot of red flags going on here right now. I know there are a lot of people researching this at this very moment. And I've left the questions that I would ask to the CFTC. If the CFTC, obviously, you can contact me through my website at arcadeeconomics.com. And with that said, I guess we'll wrap up for tonight.